Shalom, Chavarim, Shalom, Shalom. Greetings, greetings, associates, greetings, brothers and sisters, and also greetings to the audience. So the subject right here is, is Christianity the white man's religion? Now, we've heard others also discussing this and debating, even debating on this subject matter. So you're going to hear more about this particular subject matter. Is uh, Christianity, as it's called, is Christianity the white man's religion? All right, now, this is a very important subject matter, especially amongst those who are in um, what we call black consciousness. You know, for, for black peoples, once lost, now found, black and brown people here in the Americas and the Caribbean, and, and for all peoples, but especially for us, to ask this particular question, is Christianity the white man's religion? Now, some of the Hebrew and the Israelite camps, like the one Westerners, the 70 AD, 1970 AD, um, ISUPK Israelites, um, they say, yes, they say that Christianity is the white man's religion. I want to heal up right here, you know, shalom to uh, Captain Asani. Uh, you like to heal him up as well, and also um, brother, brother uh, Ross uh, Lawrence Davis, who was on the podcast um, a couple of uh, about a year, two or so ago, and um, it was a regular Saturday evening podcast. So we had a brother from ISUPK, um, the One West um, camp, and also from the African Israelites of Jerusalem, and also shalom to. Um, elder brother Yaniv as well and I Ras Ayadonis Yadon Yadon Ben Chayel right as well we was reasoning on what it is to be a Hebrew or Israelites and our particular perspective as ones and ones know was the the Israelites of Ethiopia we have a very unique testimony especially east of the river Nile but to the question here question here is Christianity a white man's religion and was it always the white man's religion or when did it become when did it become the white man's religion now we think that's the generalization you know we have to avoid the generalizations you know it's like in in, in war in battle right it says Yahuwah Ish Milhama right and in war and in battle you have to have logistics right logistics this tactics right and then you have your strategic goals the strategic goal right here the strategic goal right here is the truth right you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free so to this particular question is christianity a so-called white man as we use these terminologies today a so-called white man religion or has christianity or the belief in in christ according to the um interpretation Right? Is belief in Christ has it become right? Has it been hijacked? We have a different perspective. We say that it's counterfeit Christianity, right? That there's other forms of Christianity, right? That apparently predate what we know as the whitewash Western Gentile, right? Um, Catholic, whitewash Catholic, and Protestant Christianity that comes down to us today, especially we. Right, Beta Israel over here in the West, here in the Americas and the Caribbean. Right, our whole experience as black people, right, over here in the Americas and the Caribbean, across the trans Ethiopian, Ethiopic Ocean slave trade over here in the Americas and Caribbean. So we have our 400 plus year experience with the so called white man, the Anglo, the Anglo American, the Anglo European, the Gentile. Right? The nations go in the times of the Gentiles, the times of the nation. So to this particular question, where do we first have this term Christ and Christian? Right? I think we need to begin off right here. Right? So is Christianity a white man's religion? We say that counterfeit, what we call counterfeit Christianity, that is the so-called white man's religion. Again counterfeit Christianity, the popular Christianity that we know as the Western Gentile, Western Gentile Christianity. When we got into the studies concerning Christianity, right, over the years and the research, one thing we found clearly delineated, right, is so-called a Western Gentile form of Christianity, right, the Christianity that went to the north and went to the west, and then we had the Christianity that was in the east and went to the south, 
right, one to the south and one to the east. So we see a fundamental difference in Western Gentile, when we say Gentile, so-called European, right? We say the Romanism, right? And it's different phases. We got to look at the different phases. Even the later one, the later phases is the iconoclast, iconoclast, where he sought to destroy, you know, imagery and icons and image, imagery, right? Now, this is particularly interesting because the majority of icons and imageries that we find, at least in Europe, vis-a-vis -vis Christianity are black people or people that are very heavily, you could say, very heavily melanated, right? And now, when we're speaking about the Greeks, let me just point this out, the Greeks and the Romans, because some like to make the connection of Serapis. You might have heard, they say, well, Christianity, you know, comes from Serapis. Maybe in the counterfeit Christian, Western Gentile perversion of Christianity, even according to the Bible, my Robeno, my our rabbi, the rabbi of rabbis, our black Lord and Savior Yeshua HaMoshiach, who the world called Jesus, or they call Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, even he says that many shall come in my name. What's his name? We know the name in the West as Jesus, right? And shall deceive many. Interesting how we get Creflo Dollar recently saying that he got the tithes all wrong. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's a major thing. That's a major, you know, major thing right there, there, there as well. But that's a whole different, you know, reasoning right there. Now, once might look at Creflo Dollars and the mega churches and the TD Jakes and the other ones and say, oh, that's this is Christianity. No, what we're experiencing today, we should not confuse with what occurred in the previous days, in the ancient days. It was roughly, say, 2000 years ago. Right? Because we're just talking about 400 years. So what occurred in America with black peoples, who we identify as the Beta Israel, right? the House of Israel in captivity in the Americas and the Caribbean, is totally different right, than what happened in the first century. Until right? so the first century, we're talking about the time they call the A.D. times. Right? And when they you know, allege this is when the birth of Yesu, so Yeshua HaMoshiach, Occur Yeshua HaNotri, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. I want to emphasize Nazareth, right? Let's emphasize Nazareth because we would need to emphasize Nazarenes. See, the Nazarenes, the Nazarene movement, this was an indigenous, right? We could say Hebrew or Judaic, we could say we the black Jews in Judea movement, a messianic movement, right? So this comes right out of. Right, we could say the the Hebrews, uh, the Israelites, we say the Judahites, the, the black Jews, the Old Testament tradition. Right? This comes out of the Old Testament tradition. Right? So what we get as so called Christianity, right, is a hostile takeover today. What we what we hear generally speaking. And I I have to emphasize the West. Because most of us, when we talk about Christianity over here in the Americas and the Caribbean on the Western world, we're basically going back to the so-called Protestant Reformation, right? Then before that, you know, just with a linear, historical, chronological perspective from the Protestant Reformation, right? That back to Martin Luther, back to the Catholic Church. Then we go into the Catholic Church and we see some different movements in the Catholic Church. We have the cult of the Nicolaitanes, Nicolaitans. We have the Vaticanus. We have where this particular priesthood took over what was once the holy black, <laughs> what was once the holy black Roman church. All right, now let's go over here and let's see if we can just show a couple of exhibits. Now, all right, a couple of exhibits right here. Okay, this is this is this is one right here. And give thanks to the ones and ones that put these things together. We see some of exhibits from some of our posts but also from other posts and it's well put together and they help to give a um like a like a slide like a teaching like a, a point of view or um, a slide object lesson for example right so we see this one says how the israelites now we want to specify yes generally speaking it's the israelites but specifically speaking we're talking about the the we the black jews if we're going to really connect the historical narrative of what later on gets to be called Christianity, right? So we're going to look at Roman Christianity, 
or what has become or come up from Roman Christianity, right? The fuller corruption of the original roots is what we call, we say the whitewash Roman Christianity, right? And Jewish or Judaic messianic movement, the Yehudi, the Judaic representing the Israelites. So when we talk about the Jews, even we the black Jews, they're representing the whole family. But the ones that we get in Judea is predominantly the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, right? The tribe of Simeon merging with the tribe of Judah in, in prior history. And then also uh, Lev Levitical, the Levitical order, right? We also have the Levites, right? The Levites. But the two major tribal groups that we have in the New Testament time is the Yehudi, the Yehudim, the Jews, the Judahites, as well as we get the Benjamites. And we have this in particular in the testimony of Rabbi Shaul, aka the Apostle to the Gentiles, known as the Apostle Paulos. Right, the Apostle Paulos. So this one right here says that the Israelites began to monopolize the seat of Roman Empire, the four tetrarchs. Right? So we have the Israelites, or those of the Yehudi seed, the Jews, the black Jew seed, ruling the Roman Empire in an earlier period of time. Roughly, according to this, 284 to 324 A.D. Right? 284 to 324 A.D. Now, this is almost like, almost like 300 years, like, you know, we're going like forward in time. Right? Because we have to go kind of forward and back right? in order to, first of all, locate what time are we speaking about and what are we speaking about when we're talking about Christianity. Now, how do we even get the name Jesus Christ? Even the name Jesus Christ, as we are taught right, to say it and pronounce it today, even the term Jesus Christ right, is a mistranslation. Yeshua, Yeshua Ha Mashiach. Yeshua HaMoshiach, but yet he is first known according to the written narrative, according to the scripture, and we're going to look at the scriptures because there's more scriptures, right, or more manuscripts, right, and documents of the Bible, both for the New Testament and Old Testament, than there is manuscripts and documents for Greek and Roman history combined. I want to point that point out because this is a point that often falls below the radar when we're talking about, well, evidence. What evidence are we working with? Well, there's more evidence, right, for both the New Testament, what is called Christianity in the New Testament sense, right, both inclusive of the root, the black Jewish or the Jewish Christianity, Judeo Christianity, as well as, or Judeo Coptic, as some might refer to it, as well as the Western Gentile, right? We have both of it testified. We have the original, right, that Nazarene movement of Yeshua Ha Notri, right, Jesus of Nazareth, right, Jesus of Nazareth. So here's where we have to go to the scripture here, right? Let's go to the scripture right here. Right, just looking at some of this right here, because we need to go over history and put things into the historical, right, the historical um, context. Right. So here is one verse we would like to share right here at the outset, Acts 11 and 26. Right now, the time of this writing, at least what time this writing is speaking about. This writing here is speaking about within the 40 to 50 year period of time. Right, conservatively speaking, after the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua HaNotri, a.k.a. Yeshua HaMoshiach, Robeno Adonino. So this is roughly, say, 70 A.D. Will we say the temple is still standing at this time? We will say at this particular time, it appears that the temple in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, is still standing at this particular time. So this means that this is anywhere from like 30-something, you know, A.D. to just before 70, right, A.D., right? And because of who is testifying to, Hawaria Paulos, or Rabbi Shaul, Saul, right, we can definitely say, well, this is in the approximate time period of the Moshiach, so this could be maybe 40 A.D., 50 A.D., or 60 A.D., somewhere within that range. We can get into more details on the timing and the exact or at least a more 
exact time, right? But we do have a good approximate window, right, for when these particular events, you know, when these particular events, you know, took place, right? Or what it's testifying to. Because we just want to put a historical narrative to this. Because some make it seem like, well, this was written hundreds of years later on. It might have been rewritten. It might have been embellished. It, you know, maybe there's other versions of it, right? But what we're looking at right here is for the core, right? The core testimonial. And it says, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antiochia. Antiochia, right? Antiochia, Antiochia, right? And what was Antiochia? It was the capital of Syria situated on the river Orontes, founded by Seleucus and Nicanor in 300 BC. I want you to note that, that, that date and time right there, right? Founded, right, by basically, we say the Greeks, right? The, the, the Gracoi, the later day Greeks, because the early Greeks were Ionians, the Minoans, the Keftiu. We see them on the wall painting in ancient Mitzrayim, and we can see that they were melanated, at least, peoples, right? So in 300 BC, and named in honor of his father Antiochus. So Seleucus Nicanor, he took over this Syrian, you know, the Syrian city right here, and he basically named it in honor of his father Antiochus. How we get Antiochia, right? Antioch, right? Many Greek Yehudim lived there, and it was here. So when we're speaking about the the Greek Jews, it's like speaking about like American blacks. I just want to make this context, right, a context for, so we can um, read with comprehension, right? So they were black people, but they were like American blacks, right? They were, they were Greeks, right, in so far as where they were socialized, right? But as far as the people that they were, it's like we as black people say, well, we're black people over here in America, but we really have African roots. We're from Africa, you know, because they brought us from the continent, so forth and so on. Look at our DNA, this and that, you know, making those links right there, right? But as far as our socialization, right, is English a white man's language? Let me ask that question right there. What language is the majority of one speaking? Even those who are speaking against the Bible, the majority of them basically speak the same so-called white man's language, right? So they talk about the white man on one hand, right? But they're talking about the white man, right, in the white man's language. Let's just point that out. Same thing with these Yehudi or these, these um, Yehudim. Right, these Jews, that though they were Judaic and, and, and maybe Judeans as well, they were socialized as Greeks. So many Greek Jews lived there. And it was here that the followers of Christ were first called Christians. No. See, what they're doing is anachronistic. This is anachron this is the out of time. The followers of Mashiach, of Yeshua HaMoshiach, of Yeshua HaNotri, the followers of Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua HaNotri. See, this is why when you look in the New Testament of the Bible, you'll find that there's many cases and many examples where he is referred to, right? Where he is referred to directly as, Yeshua is referred to directly as Hanotri of Nazareth, right? The Nazareans. And this is why we also have Nazarene testified, right, within the Brit Hadasha, the New Testament text. So the more correct wording of it is that they were followers of Yeshua Hanotri, of Jesus of Nazareth, right, who by his followers was identified as being HaMoshiach, and therefore the next nomenclature, Yeshua HaMoshiach, that gets translated through the Greek down to us today as Jesus Christ, but to the original followers of Yeshua HaNotri, he was Jesus of Nazareth. And the whole terminology of Christos or Christos, right, was just for purposes of um, interpretation, right? We're going to bring that forward. But here, the followers of Messiah, of Jesus of Nazareth, were first called Christians. Now imagine if this note here, the G490, was, was written like that. This is why we have to be critical and critique these things, and this is why also in our going forward to preach and teach these things, we have to make these updates. Because it's easy from today's perspective to call them followers of Christ, but when we actually study the text, they were followers of Yeshua HaNotri, 
right? And their faith, their emuna, ma'amin, the imnet, the faith was that he is Hamushiach. He is the prophesied Messiah, right? But Messiah, Mashiach, is a Hebrew term. The world, like today, was being run by a foreign culture, a Gentile culture. Like the world today is run by English. So if we do a video, a vlog here, and we speak it mainly in English, right, it'll reach so many ones who are able to understand English. It's like a universal language. Same thing with the Greek. The Greek was a universal language, you know, at that particular time, right? So by those who were were not followers of Yeshua HaNotri. They say, well, who are those people? Instead of them going into Hebrew and saying, oh, they are the Meshachim. Meshachim, Meshachim, what is Meshachim? Meshachariyan, Meshachim, what are you talking about? You know, oh, they're the Christianoi. Christianoi, Christos, Christos, oh, anointed, oh, they follow, oh, you mean Jesus, oh, yeah, they, oh, those are, those are them. Okay, we're going to call them Christianoi. We're going to call them Christian. Why? Because Christos, right, is an interpretation of Messiah or Moshiach. Going further, second entry. A city of Pisidia on the borders of Phrygia, founded by Seleucus Nicander. Under the Romans, it became a colonia and was also called Caesarea, Caesar, Caesarea, Caesar. That's the, that's the way it would have been said in the ancient time. Not Caesar. Caesar is how we say it in the later day times. But see, that covers up the real pronunciation and what really is being said and what really was said. The city was called Caesarea, Caesar. Caesar was not pronounced like that. It was pronounced as Caesar. Interesting when we then address the Kaiser Borgia, right, and the image of the beast and Antichrist, right, from Antiochus, a Syrian king, right, and down here we have Antiochus, a place in Syria, Antioch. So it's at this particular place when it says, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, right, with the church, Ecclesia. Ecclesia. Look what it says. What's Ecclesia? A gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place and assembly. Now, putting it into the more specific, we see where it says in the B definition, the assembly of Israelites. More specifically, the assembly of Yehudi, of Jews, especially those black Jews, Yehudi, those, those Judean Jews, right, that believe that Yeshua, Hanotri, that Jesus of Nazareth, was the prophesied Moshiach among this group of Yehudi. Because this is how it began, right? Even Yeshua HaMoshiach says that ye worship what you know not. We know we worship for salvations of the Jews. He didn't say of the Israelites. He said of the Yehudim, right? That any gathering or throng of men assembled by chance, okay, in the Christian sense or in the Nazarene. So we do need to do is update words. Okay, here's where the confusion comes in. A lot of anachronistic mistakes and errors. And this allows false teachers right, to put across false doctrines and make you think that, oh, yeah, Christianity is a white man's religion. When we see clearly that it comes from the roots right, of an Afro, we could say Afro-Semitic, Afro-Asiatic, or basically an Afro, you know, Shemitic people known as the Hebrews, known as the Beta Israel, and specifically known as the Ihud or Yehudim. So in a Nazarene sense, the D should be in a Nazarene sense, the assembly of Nazarenes, later to be called Christianoi, Christians, gathered for worship in a, they say here, a religious meeting. A company of Nazarenes, or of those who hoping, according to what's written here, for eternal salvation through Yeshua HaMoshiach, through Yeshua, who is identified as HaMoshiach. So the Hebrew says Yeshua, the Messiah, right? Then in English, we get the Jesus Christ, Jesus anointed, right? Observe their own religious rites, hold their own religious or spiritual, you say, sacred meetings, and manage their own affairs according to regulations prescribed for the body, for order's sake, right? Those who anywhere in a city, village, constitute such a company and are united into one body. So they're one corporate body. So many members function as one body. They're the body of Moshiach, of the Messiah. 
of who Moshiach Yeshua is the head the whole body of Nazarenes right so this is all about well who do you want to believe right who is the people that call them right People call us as black people many different names, every type of different byword we notice in the 400 year history other than a child of God. We've been called Negroes, niggers, coloreds, you know, uh, um, all other kind of names too, not to go into all these other bywords that we are called, right? And now we find ourselves seeking, well, who are we, right? Through the black consciousness and for us, the black Christ, the black messiah, mindfulness, we're searching for our true identity, our true ID. Why? Because others have called us this. This is what we get in Acts chapter 11 verse 26. We get an indigenous group of people with their indigenous belief system being called something by others, by, by a whole other group of people. They have different beliefs. And they're also of a different ethnicity that later on would come down into this racism, white racism, and pseudo white supremacy sort of thing. Right? This is what we talk about counterfeit Christianity. Right? The whole body of Nazarenes scattered throughout the world, the, the faithful, uh, the assembly of faithful Nazarenes already dead and received into heaven. This is according to what's right here. But ecclesia directly is this it's a calling out. Right? It's a popular meeting that means it's populated by people, especially a religious congregation. They say religious or for spiritual we say purposes, the Judaic synagogue, Knesset, or the Nazarene. It was the Nazarene. Originally, it was a Nazarene community because it was after the namesake, Yeshua HaNotri, Jesus of Nazareth. Right? But Gentiles and other peoples called this something else. I often sometimes use this as a point of reference. You know, we're Rastafari, but others might call us Rastas, or they talk about Rastafarian, or they bring up these other philosophies of Rastafarianism. You know, they add their own terminology and then have many of us, right, who are moving on slow gases, not recognize the trick, as Burhana Selassie says, a trick, right? We have to continue speaking the truth even if they continue speaking the lie, because the truth will overcome the lie, right? So there were Nazarene community of members on earth and the saints in heaven or both, and simply put the assembly or the church, a called out assembly. But it's no different from when we read in the Hebrew. If we're looking at the Hebrew, we have similar terminologies when we have the assembly in the wilderness. In fact, Stephen, in chapter 7 of Acts of the Apostles, he calls the tabernacle in the wilderness, in the, in the books of the Torah, five books of Moshe, he says the church in the wilderness. That means that we had church in principle before we had church in the latter-day nomenclature, church, because the meaning of it is they called out assembly. See, they, they try to fool you with word games, play word games on you. We're going back to what was the original word games and whose words was it and who brought in the game, right? So they assembled themselves within the church to call out assembly and taught much people, taught enough, enough people. And the Talmudim, the disciples, were called, you see the word? Christians first. Uh-oh. So the first place, this is the beautiful thing about this particular verse right here in Acts 11 and 26. It actually shows us that where were they first called Christians. So my question is, what were they called before they were called Christians? What were they? Right? And also, along with that question, even before that question, who called them this? And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Right? Going into this verse a little bit more. Right? And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch. Right? So they began now to be called by this byword, and this is the byword here. It's the G5546, all right? So what's clear about these Yehudim, these Jews, Judahites, like Paul, like Peter, like the other disciples, we know clearly they are Yehudim, they are Jews, you know Yeshua, right, is a Yehudi, a Yehudim, even as we, the black Jews of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, that they are Yehudi, they are Yehudim, right? But now they're being called Christianos, Christianos, what's Christianos? Christianos, here the Thayer definition, 
right? The G5546, a Christian, a follower of Christ. But what does this mean, Chabarim, right? A follower of Christ. We go to the word Christos. We have Christos. Christos is anointed, right? And here they tell us that Christ was the Messiah, the Son of God. No. Christos was a interpretation of the Hebrew Mashiach, right? And the Moshiach, Ha Moshiach here is the Bain Elohim Chaim. Right? He is the anointed in simple text, simple terms. Now you notice right here where it has two G references, right? One is Creo. Creo means to anoint, right? In the Greek language of the time means to anoint in the language. And then we have Messiah. Messiah is you see, they tell you the Greek form of Messiah. And they say a name of Christ. <laughs> you see how they play around with this? Really, Christ, Christos, is to say Messiah. It's like if I say Moshiach, and you don't know no Hebrew, and you say, well, what does that mean? And we're speaking English, and I say, that's the anointed. Then later on, you say, well, the name of the anointed is Messiah. It's that sort of thing they're doing right there. So here we have, you can see what says Messiah, that is Mashiach, Mashiach. Then here we have the Mashiach. Now here we go directly to the Hebrew. Now this is getting to the, we say the pre-Greek, pre-Roman, the pre-whitewash, you know, iconoclast, all of those things that would come along in the 2000 or so years later on. Here we're getting to the very root, the H4899 anointed anointed one of the messiah the messianic prince also the kings of israel we have shaul saul the first king of israel he was anointed david right david he was anointed shalomo he was anointed we have prophets and priests we have the first christ in the bible is the hebrew messiah known as Aharon, the first, quote, Christian, so to speak, in the Bible were the other messiahs, and that was the sons of Aharon, the priests of Yisrael. So here we're looking in the context of our own indigenous roots, right? This is all before Acts of the Apostles, right? Chapter 11, verse 26, right? So the high priest of Yisrael also is a Moshiach. So this is basically giving a point of reference in the scripture to those who carry this particular title of Messiah. Some people think that, well, Yeshua is the first and only one being referred to as Messiah. Not so when we get into our own Hebrew, Judaic, and scriptural and Israelite roots, right? Cyrus, Koresh, who was a Gentile, Cyrus and Darius, you know, Medo-Persia, he was uh, the first at least according to the scripture, the only non, we say, Israelite, non-Yehudi or, or Judahite that is referred to as Moshiach or Messiah within the Hebrew scriptures. Just to point that out there. Right? He is the exception, we'll say, to the rule. Cyrus. Right? He's the one that made it possible for the, for the black Jews, the Judeans, right, to return. Right? Um, to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, you know, after the Babylonian captivity. This is all recorded in Ezra, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, right? Then we have the patriarchs, also the patriarchs, the forefathers who are also anointed. So Strong's bring out the sense of anointed, usually consecrated person. You see where it has a king, a priest, or a saint, right? To say like a saint or a prophet. Kings, priests, and saints or prophets, specifically the Messiah. Now, when we say the Messiah and we emphasize the the or the the, right, especially in the Brit Chadasha sense, we're pointing to the expected Moshiach that the Yehudi, the Yehudim, right, had many ideas of and also expectations of the Messiah to come forward in the first century or sometime around that time. Right? And therefore, this is when we get the birth of Yeshua, right? Hanotzri, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, let's bring this up here as well, just getting to the root. So here is when they first were called this, we're in Antioch. So while it was being called Christianos in Antioch, remember Antioch was a city that was founded by Seleucus uh, Nicanor, 
right? A Syrian king under the Greek influence. You remember Alexander the Great had, had already influenced that whole area. It's like looking at the world and seeing how many people are influenced by the Anglo-American, English, American culture. How many people around the world are influenced? Even in other cultures, other languages, you know, they adopt and adapt many things that we say is a part of this Anglo-European or Anglo-American culture. That also includes us as black people over here when we talk about hip-hop and music and other things and styles and so forth and so on. Just that influence, right? Does that mean that black people are directly responsible for that? Or is it a matter of influence? So we also have to recognize the influence of the black people or, or these, this particular group of black people. Because in the ancient world, there was many different black peoples. Sometimes they got along together. Sometimes they fought against each other. Right? So we shouldn't look at black people in ancient times as being a monolith. You know what I mean? We can find on the wall paintings where pharaohs of ancient Egypt were fighting against people who appear to be different light skin or different ethnicities of people and sometimes against people that were their similar complexion sometimes people that were darker to them what does it tell us it tells us that we can't get stuck on this latter day you know white racism these false concepts that we and humanity has been forced to be like eve over 400 years so a follower of christ a christian Right, that's what it says. But where does this come from? Let's get to the very root. So let's look up Christ, right, and Messiah. The same way we saw it right there, and Messiah. Right, Messiah. Back that up, Messiah. And here we have two verses. Two verses and only two verses in the KJV, King James Version. First verse is John chapter 1, verse 41. Because we're asking the question, is Christianity a white man's religion? All right, now, according to this particular name, right, we know the, the, the name Christ or Christos come from the, the latter-day um, Koine Greek. And now some would believe that the Greeks, right, or the people who are called Greeks, they were always white people. But if we study far enough back, we recognize that the people were black before they became white. The same thing with the Romans. They were black before they became white. So we have the Minoans, we have the Keftiu, featured on the wall paintings of the monuments of ancient Mitzrayim, ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, and we also have the Struskins as well, right, to show that the people were black before they became white, right? But then again, we can look at modern history, Australia, America, South Africa, places that were indigenously of the indigenous people that have been taken over by foreigners, and foreigners have given a whole new look to it. So we kind of forget the previous history. This is what's being forgotten. The previous history at the core of what is called quote Christianity was one the Jewish or Judaic the black Judah Yehuda movement right that's represented by the head by Yeshua HaMoshiach that's represented by the body of the Nazarenes right the Nazarenes remember Nazarene referred to Hanotri to Nazareth this identifies well who was their rabbi who is their teacher? You know what I mean? Who is the teacher? Who is the rabbi? Who is the point person? So here in John chapter 1 verse 41, he first findeth his own brother Shimon or Simon and saith to him, we have found the Messiah. You see how that's written a little differently, but then we show this right here, Messiah. It says it's the Greek form of Messiah, right? And it says the origin is of Hebrew origin. So notice, it's only because of translation that even the question about Christianity being right, a white man's religion. In fact, the more appropriate question is when and how did Christianity become a white man's religion? That's a more accurate, but from the very beginning, we're seeking to show and prove that it was not a so-called white man's religion or belief system because the origin is Hebrew. We have the origin being Hebrew, Mashiach, right? There we have the Mashiach, the anointed one. We went through this already just to go through it once again. So the origin right there. But let's get into the more of this verse here, John 1 and 41. So we have found HaMashiach. So what they said in the Hebrew is we found HaMashiach. We found the Messiah. 
which is being interpreted. You see that word interpreted, right? Loss in translation, right? Interpretation, which is being interpreted. So here we have the method maneu, method maneu, method maneu, method maneu. What is method maneu? It's the G thirty one seventy seven. Thayer definition says to translate into the language of one whom with whom I wish to communicate to interpret. Okay, so meter. Let's get the Greek word here. Meter or meter maneu. Meter maneu, right? The G thirty one seventy seven is defined by Thayer to translate into the language of one with whom I wish to communicate to interpret. So that means if I'm translating into the language of somebody else that I'm wishing, that means they're not from my same language. So that means I'm coming from my own roots, right? And I'm trying to figure out a way to communicate or interpret the truth of what I am and what I be, right? To someone else who's outside of this. Remember how the Torah talks about to the homeborn, right? The homie the homeborn and to the stranger that sojourn with you. That principle from HaTorah is also in effect right here, right? As we have it, we have found HaMoshiach that is being interpreted Christos, right? Christos or Christos. So basically it was taking two words from two different languages that mean anointed. In the original sense, it's a Hebraic, it's a Hebrew concept, a Hebrew idea and therefore an Israelite and a Judahite idea, right? That now right is being interpreted, right, because the outside world is like like we said before, if ones were not familiar with Mashiach and we said Mashiach and you say, Well what is Mashiach? Ha Mashiach, right? Mashacha, right? And you don't know what it is, we will try to interpret if we wish to communicate with you into the language of Communication and the language of communication at that time happened to be Greek. So when people say, oh, look, it's written in Greek and these hypocrites, you're speaking English. You're speaking English while you're saying pro-black, pro-black, pro, you know, well, what about our other languages? So coming from that perspective right there, right, we can clearly see that what is called Christianity, right, in its origin, Right or before we get the term Christianity, what we're dealing with, or you know what's being being expressed here, is an indigenous Hebrew, we could say belief, faith, spirituality system. In John 4:25, the second place, the woman saith to him, "I know that Messiah, Mashiach, cometh, who is called Christ." Why is he called Christ? Because the majority of people are not very strong in the Hebrew. Like a majority of pro-black people are not very strong in whatever other African or black languages. Need we say this? We have to say this. Is that we may talk about ancient Egypt, uh, Kemet. You know, at least some are studying these things. You know what I mean? But still, we are, have to communicate in English. Right? At the present time. So at that present time, they also... Does that make their belief in Moshiach, Messiah, from a Hebrew perspective, any less. Their being Nazarenes from the root, because someone else is calling them Christianois. Does that change what they are? Does that now make their origin Christianois? Were they not existing before other people called them Christianois? Right? So it says, when he is come, he will tell us all things. So Moshiach. This was a sign that many believe that when Moshiach is come, he will tell us all things. All right? Now, right here, there's something that Yeshua says right here, this verse we've gone to before, right? John chapter 4, verse 22. It says, Y'all worship, he's speaking to the same Samaritan woman. Now, the Samaritan were kind of a mixed breed of people. Samaritans were not ethnically Yisrael but they did believe and they were socialized you could say as Israelites you know in the Israelite culture right in the Israelite faith and belief 
plus they had a lot of their own belief, the Samaritans. Remember the Samaritans? Samaritans were um, other peoples that the king of Assyria had brought in to replace the population of Israelites, the ten tribes that he had sent into exile. Right? So now we get the Samaritan, you know, the woman of Samar Samaria, the Samaritan woman, and Yeshua in this, this reasoning with her. Right? And we can see clearly in the reasoning there is a dichotomy, a difference between being Yehudi, being Jew or Judean, right, or Yehudi, right, because Jew can be twofold. The first is being of the tribe of Yehuda, of Judah. The second is being a faith of the tribe of Judah, because Judah is the last of the Israelites, like on the front line here in the first century time. The rest of the ten tribes are off in exile. So the tribes that we have knowingly right here in Judea in the first century is Yehuda, is Judah, a.k.a. the Jews, Yehuda. Remember, that's twofold. In the first sense, it's speaking of someone who's of the tribe of Judah, like a descendancy, right, of the tribe of Judah. In the second, is of the faith, right, of Yehuda, of Judah. Because there was this thought that prevailed among the Judahites that, well, we have survived and been able to maintain our identity, unlike the ten tribes, because we have been, by and large, more faithful to the covenant, right? More faithful to the covenant. So we are still here to represent. I call the Judahites in the first century the last of the Jedi. Jedi, you know, the last of the Jedi, so to speak. But he says now to Samaritan woman that ye... And ye mean you all, speaking to her and her fellow Samaritans, worship ye know not what, because of her previous statement, right? He goes on to say, you know, we know, he says, we know what we worship. We know. So Yeshua is making a difference here, a distinction between the Samaritans in the north, right, and the Judahites, the Judeans in the south. And he's saying that we, Judahites, Yehudi, we know what we worship for salvation. Over the way he says, for salvation, Yeshua, Yeshuot, is of the Yehudim, is of the Jews or the Judahites. Now, Paul says some very interesting things right here. Let's just go to Paul right here, where Paul says how he's a, you know, of the tribe of Benjamin, and he is a, let's see, a Jew. Is that in the same verse? He's of the tribe, right, of Benjamin, right? He's of the tribe of Benjamin. Let's go down here, right here. Let's go to the tribe of Benjamin, right? Boom. Okay, we have this in a few, in a few areas right here, right? Let's go over here. Let's go to the first. Okay, here we have... Um, Right, and, 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 and it says uh, da, 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 by the space of 40 years. Okay, that's the other Saul. That's, that's the other Saul, 1321. And in Romans 11 and 1, he says, this is Paul here. He says, I say then, hath Elohim cast away Amo, his people? Now, why is Paul saying this? Because the situation of the Yehudi, the Judahites, and Rome, and the political situation that they are in right now. This is all prior to and before the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem in 70 AD, right? The massacres, the killings, the enslavements, the exiles, the fleeing into the East, East Africa, the continent. He says, he says, Khalila, Elohim forbid, for I also, what does Paul say? Am an Israelite. So Paul recognized he's of the Beta Israel. He's an Israelite. He's of the seed, right? The race, the seed of Abraham. And here he says he's of the tribe of Binyamin, right? So here Paul identifies himself as being an Israelite, right? Because the two main tribes that we have here, right, is Judah, Yehuda, and Benjamin, right? But as a collective, they are referred to as Jews, Judeans, right? Referring firstly to their ethnicity, and then secondarily to their belief. Now, in the second sense of their belief, others, right, who were not ethnically Yisrael, right, could become, by the processes and procedures the scribes and the Pharisees had initiated, they could become Yehudi, they could become Jews, 
right? In other words, right? As in practice. Here, right, in um here we have here we have Philippians, right? In Philippians, right, he says he says circumcised, he's speaking of himself, right? Um Paul, right? He says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Yisrael. Right? He's of the stock, the genos, the kindred, the family, right, of Yisrael. Like he's saying, like he's of the DNA. He's of the tribe, specifically of Binyami, right? He says, and Hebrew, he's a Hebrew, right? Speaking of his spirituality, of the Hebrews, of those of this crossing over spirituality from low degrees to high degrees, from materiality to true spirituality. As touching HaTorah, as touching the Torah, He's a Pharisee, right? And what the Pharisees, right? He's a sect. He belonged to this particular sect, right? As we have different sect of the Israelites, you know, different camps. He belonged to this particular popular camp that seems to have started after the Yehudi exile. In addition to Old Testament books, the Pharisees recognized in oral tradition a standard of belief and life. They sought for distinction and praise by outward observance of external rights. So now, now they had some good points to them, but it's the bad points that basically it's your debt that outweighs your, your good credit. They, here's the debt. They sought for distinction and praise by outward observance of external rights and by outward forms of piety to like make people believe, right? And such as ceremonial washings, fastings, prayers, and alms giving, they got to be very ritualistic and comparatively, comparatively neglect of genuine piety, the genuine things of the faith, right? They prided themselves. They were caught up on pride on their fancied good works, right? They held strenuously to a belief in the existence of good and evil angels and to the expectation of a Messiah. I want you to see this part right here, that what did they hold to, right? It says right here that they, it says, they held strenuously to a belief in the existence of good, right, and evil, let's go right here, good and evil angels and to the expectation of a Messiah. You see that? So the Pharisees also shared that. And they cherished the hope Right, that the dead, after a preliminary experience, right, either of reward or of penalty in Hades. Now, Hades is a Greek idea. The Hebrew of it would be Sheol. Let me point this out, Sheol. Like in ancient Egypt, they had the idea of the Tuat, the Tuat or the Duat, the underworld, what's known as the underworld, right, would be recalled to life by him. So they believed in a sort of a resurrection, we can see this clearly in the pharisaical belief, right? And be requited each according to his individual deeds. So there's a lot of the beliefs, some of the basic beliefs of the Pharisees that are also the beliefs of the Nazarenes and even the master, right, Harab, right, of the Nazarene Yeshua, Hanotri, right? In opposition to the usurped domination of the Herods, the Herodians, who were Edomites, right? and the rule of the Romans, also Edomites, right? They stoutly upheld the theocracy, like a government ruled by God, right? And their country's cause, so they were very, very patriotic. They were about like a theocracy, a God's government, God is going to rule these things, and about their country, their people, their patriotism, and possess great influence with the common people. The common people looked up to them. Like in countries that have orthodoxies, we can compare this with Ethiopia, right? Orthodoxy there, we can compare it with orthodox beliefs, you know, amongst different peoples. Not necessarily even Christians, but it's different people. This is just something's a human nature, right? According to Josephus, they numbered more than 6,000. Now, here's the point. They were bitter enemies of Yeshua and his cause. He was like a troublemaker to them. Although, what's interesting is that there were some shared common denominators, right? But Yeshua was telling them that they were off, they were wrong, and were in turn severely rebuked by him for their avarice. So he, he openly rebuked them for their greed, 
for their ambition and they hollow the empty reliance on outward works and show you know like 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 making people believe make believe and everything and affection of piety in order to gain popularity so they pretended to be pious so that they can be popping right it's almost like social media in a sense you know what I mean you know they were like spiritually in a sense clickbaiting in a sense right the origin of this right here is parash right parash to make a distinction to declare so this is the hebrew term right here parash right separation distinction right it's, it was a term that we use also when we study right so there's it, it an application of this to the principles of our discipleship but they apply these principles not just to how they studied and how they learned the truth but to themselves in a prideful sort of way, right? So in a sense, they, they projected what they should have been actually really doing for real, you know what I mean? So here we get a separatist that is exclusively a religious, a Pharisean, right? A Jewish sectary, right? Like, like sectarian. It's like today we have different camps of, of Israelites, of Hebrews, even on some level, like in my father's house, there's many mansions. It kind of goes with that right there. Now, I point this out right here because this is what Paul right, is saying of himself. Just to identify, you know, how Paul, like when he says, and he mentions one more thing I want to show you, where he identifies himself as a Jew, right, as a Jew, right, where he talks about we are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, right? It says... Um, he goes on down here. You can see there's a lot of Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile. There we go right there, Galatians 2 and 15. We who are Yehudim, who are Judahites by nature. Notice what he's saying here, what Paul is saying. We are, we're not Jews just because we believe in Judaism or the Judaic way, but he's saying that we are Yehudi. There's something deeper He's saying in our nature, our nature with being Yehudi, even we, the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah, he's saying we are Yehudim by nature, by nature and not sinners of the Goyim, of the nations, of the Gentiles. This is a powerful verse right here. All this is what Paul is communicating, right? You know, and he, he goes into this and this is where the context of his other statements of Jew and Gentile have often been misunderstood and misapplied and mischaracterized within the latter-day counterfeit Christianity, a.k.a. the latter-day white man's religion, right? So it's Christianity, right? A white man's religion, right? So what we have right here, right? What we have right here is, is, is Paul, right? A likeness of Paul, Yeshua HaMoshiach, right? And so it's very clear, right, that if we ask ourselves, is Paul, you know, is Paul um, proud to be a Yehudi, right? So what is Paul saying? He say he's an Israelite, right? He say he's a Yehudi by nature. It's in his nature to be a Yehudi. It's not in his religion. So how we looked at being Yehudi, even if we were not of the tribe of Judah, we're of the proper faith. That's why Yeshua says the Samaritan woman, that ye that y'all worship that which you know not, we know what we worship for salvation, right? Yeshua, Yeshua is of the Jews, is of the Yehudim. That's a powerful statement that often Christians would ignore, right? So even though the Jews, right, are on both sides of this, when I say the Jews are Yehudim, there were those Yehudim, those Jews like Paul, right, like Peter, like what, like the Talmudim, the apostles, um, the disciples, the others, right, that were Jews or Yehudi, even of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin and maybe even remnants of other tribes that had faith that Yeshua, right, is HaMushiach, that Yeshua HaNotri. Let's just touch on this right here, Jes Jesus of Nazareth, all right, Jesus of Nazareth, all right, so right here, in Jesus of Nazareth. Let's bring this up right here, brothers and sisters. All right, Jesus of Nazareth. Let's look up Nazarene. 
But we just need to make that point here, right, Nazarene. Because we alluded to it, right, Nazarene. So here we go to two, two verses in KJV, two verses. Matthew 2 and 23. And he came and dwelt in a city of Nazareth. Now, let me point out that Nazareth and Nazarite in the Hebrew is not the same word. Let me just make that clear. All right. Nazareth right, and Nazarite is not, just to make this clear, is not the same. All right. Nazarene right, and, and being a Nazarite is not one and the same. It seems to be the same. And the reason why it seems to be the same is because of translation, right? There are certain sounds, right, that English does not have and that we're not used to saying. It's like when I hear a lot of the Hebrew Israelites pronounce some word in Hebrew that has a Q. Often they have to put like a, a U sound, right? We're not used to pronouncing certain sounds because of the language and the, you know, we could say the linguistics, you know, the language and the linguistics that we have been, um, you know, that we have been socialized under, right? But let's go through this verse right here. It says, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, right? That it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So we have this word, Nazareth, Nazareth. Right, the guarded one. Right, let's go down here. Now, here they say of uncertain derivation. This is Strong's. It's not uncertain to us, and we can bring this out in the Bible, because even the definition, the guarded one. Right, we'll bring this out. So he should be called a Nazarios. Right, one separated Nazarios. Right, Nazarios. Let's see if it brings this up. Okay, they basically just loop it. Right, they loop it, you know, they loop it around right here. Right, how shall we bring this out for you right here? Let's go to the next verse right here in Acts 24 and 5. For we have found this man, they're speaking of um, Rabbi Shaul, they're speaking of Paul, they're saying that we have found this man, a pestilent fellow, a pestilent. Right? A pestilent, like a plague. He, he's like a plague. He's like a disease, right, fellow. And a mover of sedition, a mover of stasis, standing, this standing state. In other words, he, he, is, he, is, he is affecting the status quo. Almost, if you notice, um, Shaul, Paul is getting the same fight, right, that Yeshua Hanotz he was getting as any of us or anyone would get about the truth, right? They say he's a mover of sedition. That means he's trying to st change the standing, the status quo among all the Yehudim, among all the Jews, the Judeans, and also the proselytes, the converts throughout the world. And a ring leader, right? They're identifying him as a ring leader, right? Protostates, protostates, right? One who stands in the front rank, a leader. He's a champion. He's standing first, first standing, a champion, a captain. He's a ring leader, right, of the sect, right? Horaces. What's Horaces? Act of taking, capture, storming, choice, choosing, right? A body of men following their own tenets, like a sect, a party. You know, we could say like a sect, a camp, we say today, right? It could be of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, or among the Nazarenes. Here they're saying Nazarenes. Then later on we'll get among Christians. Dissensions arising from diversity of opinions and aims. Right? And this comes from the sense of a choice, like a party, right? A heresy. Right? We hold to, like some say, well, they're ISUPK, they're not IUIC, or they're not GMS. This is kind of the sense that we get. So here it brings out Nazarios. Nazarios. You know what I mean? Nazarios. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Just wanted to share with you since um in the previous and New Testament where we pointed out Nazarene, Nazareth, 
they said in the um, BDB, I think on Thea, Thea definition, and also Strong's that was un, of uncertain derivation. That's what they say. But in studying and learning Hebrew through the gift of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, you know, the gift of tongues, we recognize, no, the meaning is there. They just didn't connect the dots. So we're going to connect the dots with the knots are, the knots are. And it's here in the H5341, the H5341. And this word here is knots are. This is where we get in the root, the Hebrew root, knots are, of Nazareth. Right, right, Hanotri, right, as well as of Nazarenes, of the Nazarenes. And the BDB brings it out to guard, to watch, watch over, to keep. The sense of it is to watch, to guard, to keep, right, to preserve, to guard from dangers, to keep, to observe, to guard with fidelity, to guard, to keep secret, to be kept close, like to be blockaded, right, a watchman. Right, being a watchman, a guard. So getting to Strong's definition of the Nazar is the guard. That's different than the Nazir. Nazir has a sense of crown. Nazir, Nazir. It's a different word. We'll do a video, get into the details, show the two different words, two different senses. But here we're speaking about the Nazar, as in Nazareth and Nazarene is different than Nazarite. These two words may seem similar in English, but it's a trick in the English because of how they translate it or mistranslate it or transliterate it. But here the Nats are, the H5341, a primitive root to guard in a good sense. In a good sense to guard as we have in Nazareth, Jesus, remember he's described as being Jesus or Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua ha notri. So notri come from the Natsar. Natsar mean to guard in a good sense, to protect, to maintain, to obey. There's a bad sense of the Natsar that can mean to conceal. So besiege a hidden thing, right? Natsar, something that's kept, the keeper, notri, a monument to observe, to preserve, right? The sense of being subtle. Right, a watcher or a watchman. So this is the sense of Yeshua, the guard. Right, Yeshua, we could say the watch. Right, the watchman, Yeshua. Right, the observer, the guarder, the keeper, guarding over. Nats are. So you see, nats are right there. That's the root. Now look at the in the sense of the scripture, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Right, his Torah. You see the Torah? So we have the Torah of Moses, of Moshe, and we have the Torah of Yeshua HaMoshiach. We have the Torah of Yeshua HaMoshiach. Right, in the Brit Hadasha. Right, the law, direction, instruction. Right, to keep his laws. So let's zoom in on this right here, just to give this as an overview and the basics of the Hebrew. Here it says, Ba Ebor. Yishameru chukayo we toratayo yin tsoru yin tsoru that they will right guard yin tsoru hallelu hallelu ya hallelu the illalalalalu the illalta illalu ya like exalt ya hallelu ya by bora yishameru chukayo we torotayo yinotsoru hallelujah. So here, 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 how does the WB that they might keep his statutes and observe? Right? But notice the, 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 the root sense of it is to guard, right? The root sense of it. So we have the H5341, was that it? H53, right? 5341. Let's see, is that? It right there. Uh, now notice we have 62 times. The first time we have this word here is in, you know, we have Natsar, right? In Natsar, in the revelation of the Shimona, um, what is it? Not Shimona, it's the, it's the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the 13th, right? Right, Shalosh Esrei, you know, the 13, 
Amido, the attributes of Yahuwah, his 13 attributes of Jehovah, of who he be. One is keeping mercy. Keeping mercy, right? He's the one keeping mercy. So we look at this in the Hebrew, right down here. Go down here to the Hebrew, right here. Keeping mercy, right? Notzir chesed, right? Notzir chesed. So it's this word right here, natsar, right? To guard, to watch over. Notzir chesed. By keeping mercy, let's see if we can just highlight this. I'm trying to highlight these two words. Let's highlight it up here. These two words. Notzir chesed. Notzir hanotzri. Right? The keeper. Right? The guarder. Right? So here we have this 62 times this word nazar or natsar. Right? Which is at the root of Nazarene. So the movement that later on will be called Christian or Christianity. Right, is a derivative right, of the Nazarene, the Hebrew, the Judaic, right, um, the Nazarene movement. And the Nazarene movement directly attaches the, Nazar, you know, the Nazarene, speaking of Yeshua. So if you go through this word right here, you can see all the times that this is used, watchman, right, watchman. O thou preserver, preserver, Yeshua the preserver, right? And Job the keeper, right? We have the keeper that keepeth, right? Right? It's reserved, right? In the Psalms we have this, right? And if you see, there's seven pages here. So there needs to be a study just on that right there, brothers and sisters, so we can see the real connection of the real name, right? And then the scripture shows us how things were. Um, 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 derived, right? How they were later on derived, right? Or derivatives, right? Here we have in 2111, and the multitude said, This is Yeshua, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. How they identified him from other ones who might have been named Yeshua. This fellow also, right, was, was also with Yeshua, Hanotri, Jesus of Nazareth. Right, showing where he came from, Nazareth, the significance of Nazareth in the identification of the true Yeshua, of Robeno, of our Yeshua. You see it here again, Yeshua of Nazareth, right, Yeshua of Nazareth. So the testimony, so therefore, this is important to understand why they are calling Paul this ringleader. He's this ringleader of the Nazarenes. So this whole Christian idea was a, a derivative to begin with. But for us to say that it's a white man's religion, even at that time, based on what we have in the scripture, it's not the white man's religion. The white man's religion is the Romanism, right? Is that Greco-Romanism, right? The white man's religion at that time was, was Mars or Zeus or whatever, you know what I mean? It was the Roman pantheon, the Roman gods, the, the, the worship of the Caesars. That's what their so-called religion was at that particular time, right? What Herod was up to, right? And we can see how there was these differences between those who were the followers of the Nazarene, of Yeshua HaNotri, and of the Gentiles. So just to make that clear right there, brothers and sisters, you know, so when the question is asked, you know what I mean, these are later day pictures, but even the later day pictures, you know, they do testify, right? They do give powerful testimonies, right? Also the other additional art and facts. And so right here, 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 you know, um, no, it's not, it's, it, it was not, but it did become, right? It did become, if you notice something in the nations, in Daniel's prophecy, notice how Egypt is not listed. Over, over that, there's an important reason. Egypt is not listed, right? And even Assyria is not listed, but Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, bringing us to these latter days and time to the toe, right? To even the toes, you know, the, the iron and miry clay, right? So it was not, right, but it became, right? It was not, but it became. We can ask the same question about hip-hop. Is hip-hop white man's music? <laughs> it all depends, I guess, on your perspective.